Evandel lekcii sa tauri aris demokrati sta sasruli. Mokle še salon zgao ke tebda uitkiro. Orientas kut met el eli sakma udat urtuli ko. Me marts kene bistu sta sta zogadat soplio arenis tuis. Chuen na ket sirizas gamar jo ba sabert znechi. Da khalin tauro bis. Միերց ինաղդոգովիս գած այվա պինանսուրի ինստիտութավիս միմարդ, ստրոյիքիս շեմ տխոյվ աշիտավ, նախետրով մատի ուծ լուրեպա, գիչվեն է իսրոմ սուվերեն տետի գացտա էր սախնձիպայպս կոնցեպցիաս դա հաղաց կապիտալի սախիտ � Հավկասիս, այնպոս սապջոտասի ուծիս դա գոպիլի ուգոսլավիս կեղնեմ սիմիտ ոմրոմ չոյն հաղաց մծ գավուսիս արտապ իգվակս, գավուսի այտապ իգվակս, գամով լիլիան իսև գավուդիվարդ, թու սապջոտակավուշի Հալապերի սրապատ չեմ ոտրի ալդադա գադավետի թուկ է պրաղաց կապիտալիս տուրս ամխարոս կեն սրապվազ ես, ադաց չվենք պիրդե բոտն են ատղեսաց գիմ է որեբ են իմ մանտրասրոմ, դեմոկրատիս դա կապիտալիս միս կործ կապիտալիս ակումուլացիաս մողա իսրոմ չվենի թավի սուպլեպա շեեց իրա, իսայու էրոգործ ուսապտխով էպիս, տագրով էպիս դա դեմոկրատիս շեն իղովիս սախելիտ, թուտ խես չվեն սակարտոլոշի կուակես էտ սիտուածիարոմ, Իսեղ պսոնիք էտ տեպա լիբերալ ուր էկոնոմիքոր մոտել զետա գոյ ունեմ եր ու ամի սիքիտ ալտերնատիվ առարսեպով, սանու առսեպով, սրաղաց մոց եմ ուլովա, ռոմել սաճաղաց դա չվենի էկոնոմիս տեպի Մարգանեցիս կոմպանի էր ոմ էլ ծարիս պլոբելի ամ սած արմոս, սակմիանը բաս ոտխիթիս վադիտ շեչեր է բաս ապ իրեպ, սարա սամի է թաշվիտասի ադամիան իր չէ բա ուբրալոտում ուշեղ այր դար աղաց սամոս պրոցենտի են անաս հաղորը պասրոմանց գավորկո էլի ամաս պիրդեպի ան, ես գամոյից ուս սոցիալ կատաստրոպած չի աթուրաշի, գամոյից ուս ընտլի են ատ գաչեր է պաս ընտելի � Հազա պաչուլի աս կամպանի իսպ խարդա ճերախթեղ մարդով դարաղաց պրեմիր մինիս մայրթար էրդիրած գակ էտ հարիս իսրոս հապատրի արկոս գիտեղ դարջենել իրաղաց տանխեպի չահուրից խա։ Մոգլետ արվարդ Սախարբիլ կանարձով սրեջքոր, որոմ էլ ստխես այի գիտխաոս լեկցիաս, դեմոգրատի իստ ասասրուլ գիտխույթ նիշինից բողոշի, մեր է դաղոմ թարեպ դա կատալցեմ սիտխաս սրեջքոս, որոմ էլ կաղցնիս տխեղանդել Thanks to the second Tamta, there are obviously more people with the same name. Uh, thanks to Dato for inviting me. Uh, I must honestly say at the very beginning that uh, I was pleasantly surprised to get the invitation to come to Georgia. Uh, first of all, because I was never here. 
And second, because I don't know really a lot about Georgia, there may be three things, well, there are three things which I know about Georgia. Uh, the first, of course, of course, is that this is the birth country of, of the great leader, uh, Josef uh, uh, Stalin. And I can hear you still have the museum in Gori, which is open. Unfortunately, this time, I won't have the opportunity to visit it. So <laughs> invite me again, and I will definitely go there. Uh, second, uh, of course, as probably the rest of, of the Western world, I, I know about Georgia because of Saakashvili and the things which happened during that period. And third, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, I think Georgia became also famous in the world because of your corrupt fight against corruption. And when you go from the airport to the city center, you can on the, on the left side, you can already see the police station, which is with completely, not really completely transparent, but at, at, at least the beginning, the entrance of the, of the police station. And uh, on the right side, of course, the Ministry of Interior. Uh, so I could say I, I know at least these three things. And I know the competition today is, uh, was really tight. Uh, so I'm really pleased that you came in such a big number. Uh, so I've heard that uh, except the protest uh, uh, which is taking place uh, against Gazprom, except uh, the problem with, with the miners, uh, also Francis Fukuyama is apparently in town. Uh, which is quite fun because, as, as mentioned, uh, the title of my lecture is The End of Democracy, which in a way is a reference to his thesis uh, on the end of history. Uh, so what, what do these three things have in common, which I just mentioned? Uh, the first, I, I think all these three things, of course, I could have picked up any other thing, but these are the, 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 the things which I know about Georgia, more or less, and I'll be glad to discuss it later with you in the, in the, in the discussion. Uh, I would say these three things uh, characterize something which, which we might call uh, historical political sequences. So the first, of course, symbolized by, by Gori and by Stalin, uh, is the period of, of communism, when, when Georgia was still part of the Soviet empire. Uh, the second one, with, with Saakashvili, uh, symbolizes, I would say, uh, the peak of something they wrongly call uh, the period of so-called transition. Uh, why the peak? Because as you know, you know better than me, Saakashvili was pro-NATO, pro-European Union, uh, pro-Bush, pro-US, uh, first privatization started and so on. Uh, neoliberal market was, uh, uh, was actually implemented or trying to be implemented and so on. So I would say this second aspect characterizes the period of transition. Although I must say there was never such thing as transition and transition actually never happened. Uh, the third aspect with the fight against corruption, I think, is actually a sort of, I would say, reality check, in the sense that we finally realized that something as transition from communism to capitalism doesn't really exist. I mean, it's, it's bloody exploitation, we should name it in, 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 in these ter terms. And that actually, I mean, this third fight against corruption, which is at the same time, you know, on this, on this surface level. So if you invent or if, you, if, you, if in architecture you put glasses on the, on the building, does it really mean that you get rid of corruption? If the police is really not corrupted so, more, so much as it was before, does it mean that the system as such is not corrupted anymore? So in this sense, I would say that this third aspect um, in a way, exemplifies uh, uh, the end of the myth of the end of history, in a way. So we didn't actually arrive in the promised land of democracy, in the promised land of, of, of freedom of choice, in the promised land of, of individual liberties, and so on. Uh, so to go on, actually, this situation uh, reminds me uh, on a joke. Uh, it is one of those jokes about uh, uh, the fish you know, which will give you free wishes if you, if you let the fish free. Uh, so imagine on one day a fisherman catches a fish, a golden fish, of course, and the fish says, okay, dear fisherman, if you, if you let me free, uh, I will fulfill your free wishes. And the fisherman thinks a bit and he says, okay, I want to be extremely rich, I want to live in a huge castle, and I want to have a beautiful princess in my bed and he lets the fish go. 
So he goes home, he lies at his very poor house uh, without any bed, I mean, he lies on the floor and so on. He sleeps, he wakes up the next day, he opens his eyes, he wakes up in a huge, beautiful castle, he's very rich, and a princess is near his side. And the princess said, says, good morning, Franz Ferdinand, we have to go to Sarajevo. As you know, Franz Ferdinand was shot in Sarajevo, and that was the beginning of the First World War. Uh, so what, what, what's the point of this, of this joke? The point of the joke is, the first point is, uh, uh, be careful with your wishes, because they might come true. And the second point is, of course, uh, that wishes as such uh, are never precise. I mean, the definition, the, 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 the characteristic, the uh, inherent characteristic of a wish is that it cannot be really precise and that it actually cannot be fulfilled. Uh, I mean, it's, it's in this case of Franz Ferdinand, uh, in, in, this, in the case of the joke, it's, it's, you can see it clearly. Uh, so someone wished to be a prince, to be rich and so on, but it, he didn't specify in which concrete historical era, uh, in which part of the world and so on and so on. So actually he woke up as Franz Ferdinand who was shot that day in Sarajevo. Uh, another example could of course be for example, uh, falling in love, when you project a lot of your imaginations, a lot of your phantasmas into the other person, and once you, for example, got, get the other person, you are, in most of the cases, disappointed because you wished for something else. Uh, but in the context of, of transitional societies, uh, such as Georgia, such as Croatia, such as Serbia, all the post-communist countries uh, which are in this so-called transition period from communism to capitalism, uh, we could imagine also another variation of the joke in the sense that you can imagine a poor farmer in, let's say, Croatia or Georgia during the 60s or 70s, uh, during the totalitarian time of communism, uh, who meets the golden fish and the fish says, okay, I will fulfill your free wishes if you let me go. And the poor Georgian or Croatian farmer says, okay, I want to live in democracy, I want to have freedom of choice, and I want to have individual liberties. He goes home, he wakes up next day in Saakashvili Zero. Or he wakes up in, in post-communist Croatia or Serbia and so on, because I don't want only to speak about Georgia, because I think, you know, what you have in, in, in the countries where we come from, where I come from, uh, is the same model. Of course, you were part of the Soviet Empire, we were part of Yugoslavia, of course Yugoslavia said no to Stalin, and we had self-management, and we had a different system, more or less than the Soviet system, and so on. But what happened after the 90s, after the fall of the, of the wall, uh, is a very, very similar model. So, and again, actually we find ourselves in this dystopian scenario of the joke. We wished for something else. We wished for real democracy, we wished for real choice, and we wished for real individual freedoms. Uh, but actually, we didn't get none of this. So first, if we speak about democracy, what did we get? We got a system uh, we, in which actually we have uh, a ping pong game uh, between something uh, the British Pakistan theory, theorist and writer Tariq Ali calls the extreme center. So either the extreme center left or the extreme center right is in government and they just switch. And they are supported by the oligarchy and financial elites, uh, be it domestic financial elites or be it financial elites from the West, like International Monetary Fund, NATO, Bush and so on, or Putin or Russia, you can name it. Uh, and then citizens have the choice, which is not really a choice, that each four years they can go to parliamentary elections and choose the new leader. And they just exchange. In the meantime, of course, all these governments do what they know to do best. And this is not uh, free education, free health care, investments and so on, but it's mainly privatizations, austerity measures and so on. Uh, so here we also come to, to the second point, to the second wish, and the second wish at least for some people, for the majority of people who live in communism, was freedom of choice. Like the, 
And the thesis was that during communism, we didn't actually have a choice. And of course, we didn't have so much uh, freedom of press, freedom of speech, blah, 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 and so on. Uh, so once we reach the end of history, once we, re once we reach this heaven of liberal democracy, we will finally have the freedom of choice. But for example, what happened in, in our countries? Uh, I know that during Saakashvili, for example, uh, public hospitals were being privatized. It is something which is now happening in Croatia as well. It is a trend which is happening in all post-communist countries. So something which was previously during communist times called, uh, which was not only state ownership, but it was on also uh, social ownership, at least in Yugoslavia, I don't know how it was here. In Yugoslavia it was different, we had an even better version of, of ownership, which was social ownership, like, uh, which was a product of, of self-management. And of course I don't want to go in detail here, I can be critical of self-management as well, but at least we had some form of social ownership. So social ownership was uh, transformed into state ownership and then state ownership, here we come also to, to, to Georgia and other post-communist countries, was privatized and transformed into, into private capital. So first what was on the list was the easiest, of course, these were factories, uh, then it was telecommunications. I mean, you can imagine all the infrastructure of a country. It can be different things, like for example in Greece it was railways, now in Greece, I mean in, 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 in contemporary Greece, it was railways as well, similar to, to Britain during Margaret Thatcher. Uh, it was the energy supplies. This is also a fight which is going on in, in, in here and which is a fight which is going all on also in Syria, which is a topic which we will try to cover as well. And then of course, once you get rid of this, once you privatize all this infrastructure, infrastructure which is material infrastructure, which was built during decades and decades of communism, with all the negative things of communism, at least one thing which communism did, it really did build all this infrastructure. And during communism, we really had public and free healthcare system, public and free education, and so on. So once you privatize this part of resources, and of course natural resources, for example, water, like, I don't know, 15 years ago, we would make jokes that this will start happening. Now it's pretty normal that we all drink bottled water. It's normal that, for example, Coca-Cola has concessions on, on water resources in Bosnia, in Croatia, and in Serbia. And they started to do it right after, right after the 90s, after the Civil War. So once you privatize these things, then of course what is left? Healthcare and education. So to come back to, 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 to freedom of choice, uh, so what they succeeded to do is to convince the voters and the so-called ordinary people that if, for example, healthcare or education is in private hands, in private ownership, you will have actually more choice. You will have the choice to get better education. You will have the choice to get uh, better healthcare and so on. But this is, of course, not what happened because they, they, they forgot to add the crucial ingredient. And the crucial ingredient is, of course, money. So what does choice really mean if you don't have the capital to invest in your healthcare, the capital to invest in your education, the capital to invest in your future. And again, what does choice mean if you only have the choice to, to choose between different products? What does choice mean if you can choose between Coca-Cola or Pepsi, McDonald's or, I don't know, Burger King? Is it really choice? So again, to, 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 to give another example, we can also go into the realm of technology, uh, like Google, or Microsoft, okay, Google more than Microsoft. Google is presented as a very good company. The, 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 the logo which you probably see each day when you search through Google says don't be evil and so on. But what companies such as Microsoft, Apple, and Google do is that they precisely, under the appearance that you have a choice, that you have a choice, for example, that each day you can search for different topics, under the appearance that you can download a new program, under the appearance that you can use I don't know, either Firefox or you can use Internet Explorer, you can use Word from 2003 or Word from 2013, you can use this version of Photoshop or that version of Photoshop. What, what you can't 
can't actually do. And now I think this is really important because this is not a characteristic of we are moving actually to, to another level. This is not only a characteristic of post-communist uh, uh, transitional countries. Uh, this is the characteristic of, of a post-democratic dystopian world in which we live in. Uh, so although you have the, the illusion that you have the choice, for example, if you use Microsoft or Apple, you have the choice. Either I will have an Apple or I will have, you know, this bad guy Bill Gates and Steve Jobs is a much better guy, blah, blah, blah. Although he isn't. Uh, what, what's the problem here? The problem here is that you have choice as long as you don't use the real choice. I mean, to present it as this, like you have one level, like imagine this is your desktop of the computer. On this level, you can change the, 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 the background picture of the desktop. Yes, you can change this. You can have, you know, you remember this old windows where you can have an introductory uh, sound, for example. Each of us can uh, uh, have a different sound. Uh, if you have a mobile phone, for example, you, have, you can have a different mask. It can, it can be blue, it can be red. You can have different applications. Each one is different and so on. But what you can't really change is the operating system. So just put it into relation with Linux, for example. I, I know there are some people here who are into technology. So put it into relation with Linux. What's the difference between Linux and Windows and the operating system of Apple? The, the difference is that with Linux, you can go behind this surface. You can go behind. Let's imagine it like this. And you can change the surface. And with the technology which we use today, you can't really do that. And maybe I can, I can return to technology later, but just one more important point when it comes to, to, for example, mobile phones and so on. Did you know that Google covers 80% of the market today, which means that 80% of humankind starts or ends their day with Google, which means that they're coming back to the, to the joke about wishes, which means that, that one company, one particular company, which is very close to Hillary Clinton, which is very close to the State Department, which last year bought nine drone companies, which bought Google Maps, which bought Android, which is again 80% of the market and so on, knows what you wish, it knows what you desire, it knows what books you read. Like imagine a future dictator in Georgia, he will know that in this room uh, some leftist radicals, for example, liberals, and so on gathered, and they can know even to which porn sites you go. And this is not the only problem. The problem is that, again, you have the illusion that you have a choice. You have the illusion that you can search whatever you want, but actually you cannot go behind Google. And even if you search, if you use other search engines for which you need to, to have some degree, some level of, of, of com computational knowledge, again, it's connected. Uh, so to, to, to go a step further, uh, the third wish which I, which, I, which I mentioned, which was a wish of, of this poor farmer from, from post-communist countries, was individual liberties, which is, as you can see, also connected uh, to the second wish, wish, which is freedom of choice. Uh, what I think, I mean, individual liberties, of course, uh, uh, it was the liberal dream during communist times, it was the... the, the dissident dream, the dream of dissidents uh, from the times of communism, that in the end, everyone again will have the, the, the possibility to choose his career, to choose his education, to have free speech and so on. But what actually happened in, 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 in our countries, in post-communist countries, but not only post-communist countries, I think again, we are moving to, to a different level, it's a trend also in other countries, which we might even call post-capitalist, if you want, if we use, I don't know, uh, the, the recent work of Paul Mason and, so, and, and, and similar theorists. Uh, what we have actually today is the fulfillment of Margaret Thatcher dream. You know that the dream of Margaret Thatcher from the 80s, and then also ongoing in the 90s, and then also Ronald Reagan and so on. So the dream after the period of financialization of capital uh, cap capitalism uh, in the 70s. The dream of the 80s was uh, embodied in Margaret Thatcher's uh, a statement when she said 
there is no such thing as society, they are, all, they are only individuals. And I think we actually live today in this kind of non-existing society. Again, what does it mean? Again, it's con connected with this idea that uh, everyone has the freedom to choose his future. But then soon, this idea, which may sound very progressive, very liberal, and so on, uh, turns into a nightmare scenario, uh, which you can find, for example, uh, there is a very inspirational French-Italian philosopher called Maurizio Lazzarato. Uh, I don't know if he's uh, translated into Georgian, and he published a book called uh, The Production of the Indebted Man, where he says that what you have actually as a progression as a realization of this Thatcher's motto is that today he speaks mainly about this into the, in the context of indebtment, uh, which I think is very important, especially in post-communist countries where private banks came to the market and offered debt, debt as a sort of salvation, as a sort of exit uh, from starvation and, 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 and so on. Uh, so he said that actually, and it's much deeper uh, than only economics, because it has effects on your daily life, it has effects on your physical and psychical existence. Uh, he talks about uh, something he calls uh, entrepreneur of the self. So he said in this, uh, 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 in this era, where the motto of Thatcher was realized, all of us suddenly became entrepreneurs of the self. So it's not anymore, that, that's the meaning of Margaret Thatcher's uh, motto, it's not anymore the society, and the society is not the big state, the society is us. And the society is, shouldn't mean only, you know, taxpayers who are paying taxes and then the society gives the taxes back, but society should mean, at least in my perspective, uh, something different. It should be something based on solidarity, equality, radical emancipation. Uh, so. The, the capitalist idea, and I think this is the triumph of capitalism, that it succeeded, it succeeded not only to convince people, but it succeeded to force people to behave like entrepreneurs of the self. It means that it is not the society, I'm not speaking about the state now, it is not the society anymore who will provide, for example, uh, child care, for example, social protection, uh, for example, free health care, for example, free education and so on, but you, as the entrepreneur of the self, have your own responsibility to do all these things. So if you want to survive, it's not the society to blame, it's not the state to blame, so they can do anything they want, actually, which means neoliberal reforms and so on, which is, of course, connected in the end. But you, yourself, have the responsibility to invest in your healthcare, to invest in your education to pay for it, to invest in social protection, to pay for kindergartens, and so on and so on. Of course, how do you do that if you don't have money? You go to a bank and you take a loan. And what does it mean when you take a loan? And this is the reason why I think Lazarato's book is very, uh, very interesting, uh, because he makes a relation to, to Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, who was among the first ones who said that debt is actually connected to, to time. Because if you go to a bank and you take a loan, it actually means that if you take a loan, for example, for the next 30 years in order to buy an apartment, or what will occur, occur and start happening more and more if you take a loan, what is already happening in the US educational system, if you take a loan in order to get a PhD or decent, edu decent education, what you do actually is that you sell your future. So you don't have a future anymore. And I think this is the crucial problem. So, I could go on and on in this direction, I could go in any direction, uh, but actually we, I, we promised, and we have still some 20 minutes, I think, uh, we promised to, to show what, what, what the end, so we won't talk only about transitional countries, I think we can come back to that uh, during, uh, during the Q&A, during the, 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 your questions. Uh, what we promise to do is actually to, to cover some uh, recent uh, phenomena, some recent topics which are occurring now, uh, mainly in Europe, but it's also occurring uh, in your close neighborhood. 
Uh, and I think the protests against Gazprom are part of it because it's not only something connected with Georgia, it's actually connect connected to a broader picture of geopolitics. Uh, refugee crisis uh, is also connected to Georgia. I know you didn't uh, get so many refugees as, for example, our countries where more than half a million refugees passed in the last five, six months, or Greece or Italy and so on. Uh, so what I want to do in this second part of, of, of my lecture is actually to show what does the end of democracy, which I think is really occurring and we already live in post-democratic societies, what does it really mean when we take into consideration what is happening in, in, in the world today? Uh, so to start, uh, let's start by, by a recent, uh, uh, how do you call it? It's, it's a sort of poll uh, which uh, the German Society for Language, I, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's this name, uh, but the German Society for Language, let's call it like this, a German society who deals with language, and each year they have a competition for the most popular words in the, in the, in the previous year. Uh, so at the end of last year, uh, they, they, they again made a poll among uh, Germans, and they, 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 they find out that the three most popular words in Germany are on the first place, refugee, on the second place, je suis Charlie, Charlie Hebdo, and on the third place, Grexit. And I think, actually, although I don't always believe in these polls and so on, I think it's, it's, it's a very precise, uh, precise, uh, uh, we can call it analysis, but it, it's a precise uh, uh, perception of the main events of last year, but at the same time, I think, again, uh, what these three words, refugees, je suis Charlie, and we can see it now with Charlie as well, uh, with, with the new cover of Charlie covering Alan Kurdi from Kobane, who is now raping our, our woman in, in the West and so on, as a reference to the, to the events in Köln. We can see now that Charlie, je suis Charlie is still relevant. And third, Brexit. Uh, I think these three words actually si symbolize the three most important events of last year, but at the same time they will bring us to the most important developments in this year. And we are just at the beginning of this year, so I think it makes sense to, to speak about it. Uh, so, but I'll, I'll start from the, from, the very, from the very end, and then I hope we will return to the very beginning. So I'll start with, 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 with the terrorist attacks in, in, in Paris, uh, and also other terrorist attacks which are happening now. I mean, you have seen what was happening, uh, what happened in Istanbul, and so on. Uh, then we will go back to, to, to the refugees, then we will go back to the Syrian crisis, and I hope some time will still be left for, for, for Greece. If not, we can, we can, we can come there in, in, in next year, whatever. I mean, as you can see, all of these topics uh, require, would require actually one whole day, you know, to cover them. Uh, but, so let's start. Uh, what happened in Paris, Paris, of course, requires condemnation. Of course, innocent people died and so on. But what happened with the reaction of the Western, Western countries, I think, uh, uh, again, requires condemnation. And again, we need a clear analysis. Because from the very beginning of, of the terrorist attacks, so it was uh, Friday 13, last November, uh, and I remember it very clearly because I, I was in Berlin and I was watching all the big leaders from Obama to Merkel to Hollande and their speeches after the terrorist attacks. And what you could, what you could have seen, their main speeches after the terrorist attacks were actually a deja vu, deja vu of Bush speeches after 9-11. And then the first reactions, what happened actually is again a direction towards the end of democracy. For example, the Minister of Interior of France, the first thing which he announced was that we will have more airport, more airport controls. Uh, then at the same time, Obama is offering the help of NSA uh, to European countries. The former chef of CIA says that people such as Snowden have blood on their hands because they are using encryption. So what you can see now is actually that, and we will come to the roots of terrorism back, what we, what, what we have now actually is 
that progressively Europe, but not only Europe, but the world as such, is again, like a decade later after 9-11, they use it as again momentum to, turn, to, to move into the uh, direction of, of, a surveil uh, of a new, even more progressive surveillance society than the one which was revealed by Edward Snowden. It's moving in an even more harsh police state than we actually knew even during communist times. Why? Precisely because tech companies from the Silicon Valley are already in this game. So after the terrorist attacks, it was Hillary Clinton who will probably be the next president of US, so you can uh, predict what it can mean also for this region with more wars and so on. Uh, Hillary Clinton said that the Silicon Valley companies should be uh, uh, helping the American state, which actually means that all these mobile phones, Google, and all what we use will again be used against us and not only against terrorists. So actually, what, what we are, where we are arriving now, and I think the pictures of Brussels, uh, just several weeks later after Paris, that pictures of empty, empty Brussels were a, were, were a great symbol, a symptom of it, we are gradually moving towards a post-democratic society where you again have, you know, the classical uh, uh, lesson of Thomas Hobbes from his Leviathan was that uh, the, the idea of social contract is that you exchange your liberty in order to gain some security. And, you know, this is the thing which they are selling us all the time. So it is better to have uh, 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 control on airports. It is better to be at an airport for one or two hours, lose your time and so on, then to accept the risk that maybe at this airplane there could be a terrorist. So again, it is better that big tech companies are surveilling us, because I mean, we don't have anything to hide, although everyone has something to hide, uh, but that's not the question. It's better that they use surveillance against ordinary citizens than that terrorist acts happen. But I would go even a step further. I would actually agree with the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, who, who recently just published a new book called Stasis, uh, Stasis, which is not the Stasi, but Stasis as, a, as the ancient uh, a concept of, from ancient Greece, which describes the state, Stasis, uh, uh, in Greek uh, uh, city, city state in the fourth and fifth uh, uh, century before Christ, before New Era in which you had a war which was not a war between, only a war between different countries, so a war between different nation states, but it was a war, an internal war, a war which was happening in Athens, for example, between the oligarchy and between the pro-democratic forces. And I think what is happening in Europe today, of course, Agamben is not the first one who, who had this idea, it was already uh, Enzensberger, who in the 90s wrote a book about the molecular civil war, where the examples were the, the, the riots in LA and the war in Sarajevo. Uh, so what you have in Europe, again, I think what you have is actually a sort of war. And I think it's even more subtle, if we can call, if we can call a war subtle, but drones are more subtle than, than real killings. I mean, at least for for the US or for, for, the, for the ones who are employing it. So what we have is a situation which even the Pope, Pope Francis, with whom I don't, of course, agree on all points, uh, on many points, uh, especially after he, 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 he invited Eric Schmidt and the guys from Google recently to Vatican. That's also a very interesting trend. Uh, even the Pope said after Paris that what we are witnessing is a new Third World War. And I think in this year, to be, to be realistic, what we will witness is actually the escalation of this war. Uh, if this sounds like doom saying, if this sounds like uh, apocalyptic, I will just remind you of some symptoms of this war and then we actually are moving uh, a step back towards the refugee crisis. Uh, so just around my country where I live, Something happened which we didn't imagine. I mean, let's speak about Fukuyama's dream about the end of history now. So Fukuyama came with the thesis on the end of history after the Berlin Wall came down. And I mean, to sum it up, the thesis, I don't want to go there. Uh, the point is that 
liberal democracy will survive, and all the societies have a natural tendency to arrive at the level of democracies where there will be no walls, no fences, nothing as we have seen uh, during the bad old communist times. So what do you have today? You have a country which is not a communist country, which is called Hungary, which is a pro-capitalist, proto-fascist country, where you know the constitution is being changed by Orban, uh, where, where journalists are, are, are in jail, similar to Turkey as well, where the constitution will also be changed very soon. And you have a countries which are not communist countries and which are now building walls between other countries. You have also other countries like Denmark which are now exiting the Schengen zone. So what is happening, you know, what, what happened at, the, at, at something which is called the Balkan route uh, is that more than half a million people passed since September and the reaction of our governments more or less, some governments were better, some were worse. The Hungarians were the worst. I mean, not the Hungarians as such. I don't want to go into such characterizations, but Viktor Orban. And they went precisely in the direction which uh, the Italian Prime Minister Matteo Ranzi warned two years ago. Uh, because, you know, one of the first myths, I think there are two, two myths connected to the refugee crisis. One is uh, that uh, since it started, and already I said the first myth, that people, when it started in the Balkans, they started to speak about the refugee crisis as something which started, which again is our Western perception of the, of the refugee crisis. Because the refugee crisis already exists uh, at Lampedusa in Italy and in Greece for a decade, but it started only when the problem penetrated from the periphery of Europe, from Greece and Italy, uh, to the center of Europe, to Croatia, and then of course Slovenia, and then of course Austria, and then of course Germany. So I think this is the first myth. And the second myth, you could, see it, you could have seen it also in, in all articles. They started to, to speak about the refugees. The refugees were uh, coming in waves. The refugees were uh, as foods and so on. So what you had there is a sort of natura naturalization. And soon we will come to the, to the Syrian, uh, Syrian crisis as well. Uh, you had a sort of nat naturalization of the crisis in the sense that it was being presented as something which has fallen down from the blue sky. Waves of refugees are coming to Europe. And of course, they will destroy us and rape us and so on. And I think this is, this is the perfect example how ideology functions. Ideology functions precisely through naturalization of a concrete, precise historical process. So in the, in the case of refugees, you have the naturalization of a crisis, which is not a crisis, but it is a war, which was actually created by most of the countries where the refugees pass. Even my small banana republic where I come from, Croatia, has had its troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. Even your country, Georgia, thanks to the big leader Bush, who was dancing the traditional dance in Georgia and so on, and where you still have the street when you come from the airport, which is interesting. Thanks to Bush and to your previous leaders, Georgian troops are also in Iraq and Afghanistan. So aren't we also responsible for the crisis? I mean, when it comes to Georgia and Croatia, of course, we are not the big players. We are not so important. But when it comes to the Syrian crisis, I think what is really interesting is what, what the emails, uh, which were, you can check all this on the internet. And thanks God, I mean, technology is not only, I'm not a technophobian, Heideggerian, you know, technology will kill us. We can also use it in a different way. So thanks to technology, you can find all of this on the internet. You can find it on Wikileaks and so on. Uh, but thanks to the State Department, which is also very funny, uh, you could, on New Year's Eve, you could, you could find the emails which were published, the emails of Clinton which were revealed. And in the emails, you can now read what was just several months ago, if someone like me would say it, it would be perceived as conspiracy theory. You could see the involvement of US and France in the war in Libya. And what is the involvement? The involvement is that the, the French had a particular geopolitical interest in resources, resources. This resource was, of course, oil. And that's the reason why Gaddafi was a monster and why Gaddafi was killed and why today Libya is a failed state and so on. I mean, this is really short. 
And then, of course, you know the problem. What is the problem? The problem is that in this situation, one of the problems, which actually brings us back to uh, what you said in your introduction about the ne necessity of, of uh, public events, which are not only part of academia, because I think we have to build a counter power. We have to build a counter power because, you know, if you go back to Altizer and so on, we, will know, we, we know that uh, academic institutions reproduce the existing ideology. Uh, but it's not only that, that the academic institutions reproduce the existing ideology through the Bologna system, through the reforms of education, from the curriculum where I heard that in Georgia you had Samuel Huntington, Ferit Zakaria, and Fukuyama. So why do we wonder that the new generations will be neoliberals or neocons? Or we'll say, okay, the war in Syria is a, a good thing. But you know, the other problem is also public intellectuals, where I think, you know, another terrain of struggle is not only actual to, 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 to reform the, the academia, to, to reform it in the, in the classical uh, sense of uh, German idealism, where you go to university in or, not in order to get out of the university as labor force, but you go to university because I don't fucking care about anything except knowledge which is here. And don't try to convince me that I have to learn this knowledge in order to come to the labor market. So this is one thing. The other thing is actually I think that we have to penetrate in the mainstream media, we have to penetrate in public events and creating public events such as this, because on the other hand, there is the enemy. And in the case of France, what was revealed also recently was that there was this famous public intellectual called, I don't know if he visited uh, uh, Georgia or, or Fukuyama is enough. Uh, you, ha you have this public intellectual called Bernard Henri Levy, part of the French philosophers and so on, uh, French new philosophers, although they are not new and not philosophers at all, uh, who went to Libya as a public intellectual his cover what was that he was a journalist, but what he was doing actually that he was investigating the situation on the terrain, what are the contracts with all companies, and what can France gain. And then he called Sarkozy, and then the intervention happened. And what happened after Libya? After Libya, several things happened. We are going step back again, and Greece we will leave for the end, uh, for, for, for the discussion, I think. Uh, uh, part of the weapons from Libya. First they go to Mali, so they destroy Timbuktu. They go there because of particular resource interests, again. Part of the weapons, together with freedom fighters and so on, go with ships to Syria. And this is only the beginning of the story. Because what you have in Syria, and that's the reason why I say that we are all part of this big thing which is happening, of this big geopolitical thing which is happening, and I think it won't stop. Because, you know, have you followed the last news? The last news show the possible conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which again comes back to Syria. So what you have in Syria is, in Syria, you have at least 20 different players. You know, it's not only the US, it's not only France. You have Turkey, of course. You have Turkey who has an interest in bombarding the Kurds. You have the Turks who are using ISIS to get resources. Then on the other hand, you have Qatar, for example, who is using the Muslim Brotherhood in Turkey and who is using the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria as the most effective opposition. And at the same time, Turkey, who several weeks ago opened a training facility in Qatar, then you have pipeline politics, two pipeline politics. You have pipeline politics from Saudi Arabia, who is trying together with Qatar uh, uh, and the US trying to build a pipeline which will go from Saudi Arabia through Jordan, through Syria, and then come to, uh, to Europe, which of course is not in the interest of Russia. And what Russia is doing, Russia is trying to develop a different pipeline, which will go through Iraq and Syria, which is the so-called Shia pipeline. So what you have in the last recent conflict between Syria, uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, is precisely the escalation of the conflict between Shia and Sunnis. Because I think it was in December, I remember this well because uh, Julian Assange warned me on that. He really understands geopolitics as no one today, I would say. He warned me that Saudi Arabia opened, created something called the, which they called the Sunni NATO which consists of 32 countries. 
And what you have, what you could have seen, with for example the the killing of the of the Shia cleric recently in Saudi Arabia, and then of course you had Iran, which closed the embassy, and then you have you know a, 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 a scale a cascade of of different events, and we are here today. What you could have seen is that Saudi Arabia is using the is using Sunnism as a geopolitical device in order to get all the countries around Syria, and this is again one of the answers of the puzzle of Syria. On the other hand, you have Shia. And then this is still not the end. If you go to Iran, what you have with Iran is that with Iran, you have a very interesting situation that Iran was always perceived as the arch enemy of the US. Uh, but what you have today is actually that Iran becomes more and more important for, uh, for the US. Why? What is happening now, and this is something, I don't know if you, you, you mentioned DM, uh, the new initiative with Varoufakis or someone, this is something also which we try to fight against or at least to reveal. And this is something what actually if there wasn't WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, we wouldn't know anything about it. So what is happening now, and I think Georgia is, is a lot part of this, is something which is called TTIP, TTIP, TISA. You probably know about this triumvirate of secret agreements, or you don't know about it because they are secret. Uh, but thanks to WikiLeaks, we know something about it. And it's also part of this whole geopolitical struggle. And it's part of the, of the reason why I say that in this year, 2016, we can expect many, many, many and bloody, bloody things to happen. So what the US is trying to do is they are trying to, to get a huge trade agreement with Europe, but not only Europe. So the, 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 the TTIP will cover, or already is covering, 52 different countries in the world, 1.6 billion people, and two thirds of, GD, of the GDP. Why? Because the fear is that China until 2030, I think, uh, we'll, we, we will have 50% 50 per, 50 of the world GDP. So why is Iran and why is Syria again important? Because it lies in the middle as a possible ally to the US. And here the ch situation changes. You know, until now, and that's the reason why I think, you know, we might go into a new war. Until now, Israel, which also has an interest in Syria, which has the Golan Heights, hates. Israel, of course, was always a natural ally of US. Saudi Arabia was always a natural ally with the US. You could have seen it with supporting the Muslim Brotherhood during the so-called Arab Spring, which is a completely wrong term in Egypt, for example. Qatar as well, and so on. So you have different players which are very close to US and were always close to US. And on the other hand, you have the fear which is a very rational, although fear is not a rational category, but in this sense, it's a rational fear of the US that if it comes, and this is why I think Georgia is also part of this thing, of this development, if it comes to an integration of the Euro-Asian landmass, like this part, let's say this is the US, this is the Euro-Asia, what does it mean? I mean, why, why was the EU created? Why was the European Union created? The European Union was created because if you have a common market, then you have a bigger power. Why do companies tend to monopole? Why does Google buy Google Maps, drones, and so on? Because if it buys all these companies, it will be a stronger company. So again, if you integrate more markets, you will have a bigger market. You will be a stronger state or supranational, uh, supranational state or kind of state. So what is happening is actually that the US fears that it will come, which is already starting, to, to Euro-Asian integration, in the sense that China is already building a new, a new railway towards Europe, which will be even, 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 even in more length than the Trans-Siberian uh, railway, which means actually that in two or three days, uh, cheap Chinese products will end up in two or three days in Hamburg or in European cities. On the other hand, China uh, just recently, several months ago, uh, signed an agreement with Russia about gas, of course. So I think here Georgia comes also in the game, although I don't know much about the situation here. And what you can imagine that in two or three years, this trend will also overtake Europe. 
So precisely because of, but we go to Greece later in the discussion and I will end now. Uh, if we take uh, into consideration Greece, you know that already the port of Piraeus is 50% in ownership by the Chinese. And so again, to, 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 so already this capital is here. On the other hand, TTIP, the new secret agreement, is an attempt to build a new front which will consist of US and of, of Europe, which will give the opportunity, for example, to big corporations, to sue states. It will have effects on medicine. It will have effects on visa regimes and so on. So actually, this secret agreement would completely ch change the world, uh, change, not change the whole world, because it's one of the biggest secret agreements in recent history. What is Europe doing? Europe, the European Central Bank, the so-called Troika, actually, is still insisting on the same old Margaret Thatcher politics, on the same old direction of austerity measures, on the same old policy, if we can call it policy at all, new privatizations, new privatizations, new austerity, and so on. And it is precisely because of this ideology and policy that they are actually, which they don't perceive, they are actually leaving the open field for China or Russia to penetrate into Europe. So it is precisely because of austerity measures in Greece that the situation was opened, that the previous government of Samaras could sell Piraeus and so on, and that Tsipras now, who was a radical left, and then of course he changed the Ohi uh, into an I, and you know, you, you follow the situation, that Tsipras was forced, I wouldn't say that it was his choice, it was a forced, forced choice, also to go into that direction to open up the space for foreign investments, to open up the space for Chinese and so on. So what we can see, and precisely, and to end, to, to make a circle, actually, what we could have seen with the Greek situation last year is precisely that there is no democracy anymore. So you have a democratically elected government called Syriza, which, which was a miracle in recent European history, which was, I think, after the Italian communists from the 80s, the first time that a left radical party took power in any country, and it was Greece. You had a radical government which already in, in, in two or three months, uh, this is not something which is really present in the media because they like you know, to demonize Tsipras, Varoufakis, and so on, and Syriza as such, as some sort of lunatics. Like when it comes to the refugee crisis, okay, okay everyone is praising Angela Merkel, she invited one million refugees and so on, but one of the, one of the first laws which was approved in the Greek parliament and I was there precisely during that time, so I remember it well that day, was that the children of immigrants will get directly Greek citizenship. It is, you know, this is, Angela Merkel still didn't do that. No one did that in Europe. One of the laws which, which, which Greece did was actually, again, something which no social democrat, because social democrats, of course, don't exist anymore. And it would be good if they exist. I say this as a radical left, uh, because so, Social democracy looks like utopia today. And I mean, dangerous are the times where Thomas Piketty, for example, looks like a radical. I mean, it is nothing radical to, to make, to, 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 to give, you know, to, 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 it's nothing radical to have progressive taxation if you don't change the system. But okay, that's that digression. Other laws which, which, which Syriza did, for example, was that uh, 300,000 people, the lowest, most poor people of Greece got free electricity. More than 300,000 people got food vouchers. So you could go to the supermarket if you don't have a job and so on, you don't have a salary. Each month you can at least have, get some food. And what happened after the referendum? The third memorandum, which is now signed, and which unfortunately, precisely the same party which was under the Thessaloniki program fighting against, is now actually uh, implementing. Uh, one part of the third memorandum said that uh, Syriza has to, in a way, erase all the laws which it has made. So it means that precisely those most radical laws, free vouchers, free electricity, uh, citizenship for refugees, for immigrants, and so on, are not, are not at stake anymore, as far as I know. So again, it is a proof, I, I think, of the end of democracy and that the state where we live today uh, has nothing to do with, with democracy, 
and that the illusions of those people who, who, who come to countries such as Georgia or other countries and try to convince us that they are bringing democracy are everything but democracy. So to end, I think we have to reinvent the name of democracy. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I hope it's not, we have time for discussion, yeah? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your sort of lecture. It was really interesting in a sense. Uh, I would really much stress one point when you said like it's all of our responsibility that our armies, for example, Georgia, that our troops are present in Iraq and Afghanistan. I would disagree on this point, considering the fact uh, geopolitically that we are on the crossroads of the Russian and the American imperialism. And uh, for the last 20 years, what we had was like reproduction and recreation of the sort of liberal or conservative elites that have been serving the offices of our governments and have been directly implementing the policies that were given by the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, and later the Republican Party of the United States. Their policies majorly have been uh, sort of uh, executed under Saakashvili. General, what I want you to ask is, how do you think we could sort of organize and stand up for on a strategical level, like the public, without the support of a strong left wing or even lacking the center left wing party in the country? And also, how do you think we'll, we'll have a sort of tactics and strategy to focus on the issues that are generally sort of neglected from the media because media is more, more or less playing the cards of the sort of um, elites generally who are very much pro-NATO and European Union that have become like the utopia of the 21st century Georgia. And plus, uh, generally, for example, in, in Chiatura, like 4,000 miners have been uh, fired like two days ago. And generally these kind of facts are neglected and the whole media and the whole elites, even the academia, the academy and academia itself is very much alienated from the policies and political processes of the poor and, and what the working class is facing today. Therefore, I would really like to have your sort of opinion and your view, how can we sort of get into this struggle and how can we build up the bases and how can we organize to form a working class anti-imperialist struggle in the country? Thank you. Uh, excuse me, yeah? Okay, you're the boss. Should, should we collect uh, the questions? But not more than three because I, I will forget. Uh, so I would like to continue um, along the lines uh, that you started Where to you? elaborate. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh, okay. I'm here. <laughs> no, you're hidden behind the camera. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask about the, the competing uh, notions of, um, on, the, on, the, on the larger level, competing notions of society, but precisely uh, on the ongoing struggle which somehow manifests the tension between, uh, on the one hand, uh, a radical left, and, and, and the, on the, on the uh, other hand, uh, the rising um, right-wing populism. And in many different cases, uh, for example, um, in refu refugee crisis, there is a very uh, dangerous tendency that a left-wing, clearly formulated left-wing alternative or left-wing uh, uh, understanding of refugee crisis uh, in some ways um, um, somehow uh, complements or uh, in a way um, creates a space for um, right-wing populism to uh, exploit those arguments. So in many cases we have this sort of tendency that extreme right and extreme uh, left uh, agree 
uh, on the points of uh, uh, refugee crisis, but also on, on the uh, points of um, uh, capital uh, in uh, Europe and capital circulation and the enforcement of um, um, uh, legal mechanisms of the state. So um, how can radical left uh, propose uh, an alternative notion of um, or, or the alternative understanding of uh, current crises that are uh, being disseminated uh, throughout the Europe uh, without taking the risk of coinciding uh, the rising right-wing arguments that are spreading uh, in Europe right now. Okay. Thank you. One more. Oh, okay. Uh, so okay, let's let's start from the from the first question. Uh, I actually don't think that we disagree. That's precisely what I said. I mean, I didn't say that you are responsible or anyone from Georgia. Although I would even go so far because. If I live in a country which has the true, I'm speaking about Croatia now, which has the troop in Iraq or Afghanistan, yeah, to some degree I'm responsible. And we had an anti-NATO protests and so on. We tried to stop it, we didn't. So at least we did our share. So in this sense, I, I can only agree with you that Georgia is at the crossroads and that different governments are at the crossroads and at a different time they will get something from the Russians, then they will get something from the US, then, of course, the Russians will ask something, you know, in return. Then the U.S. will ask in return, and so on. And this is, I mean, in simplified terms, that's the, that's the situation. Uh, I mean, my first answer on a geopolitical level, before coming back to, 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 to the situation uh, in the particular, you know, uh, space in Georgia, on a geopolitical level, my answer would be a new non-aligned movement. A new non-aligned movement means that you don't have to choose Russia or US, but you have a third way. And this third way, of course, is not Blair or something like that, but the non-aligned movement is something which actually existed during the times of Yugoslavia, when Tito Nehru and Nasser formed the non-aligned movement as, as, as precisely a way to, 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 to get out of this false dilemma, either we will choose US, or, or we will choose China, either we will choose US or we will choose Russia. Because I think, you know, this is also the same false dilemma in Georgia. Like, for example, I lived, in, I lived for one year or, or a year and a half in Belgrade, in Serbia, which is still not part of the European Union. So when I gave interviews for mainstream media there, and I was criticizing the European Union, Precisely, the right-wing extremists were very happy to hear such things, that the European Union is a corrupted society which abandoned its ideals. It's a museum of abandoned ideals. Uh, it, it doesn't know to handle the economy, the refugee crisis, blah, blah, blah. It could go on forever. But this that still doesn't mean that I'm pro-Putin. I could say the same for Putin. And I think the same things go, the same applies to Georgia, you know, in the sense that if you are critical of the US, it doesn't mean necessarily that you are not critical of Putin. So I mean, a way to, 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 to get out of this false dilemma is a non-aligned non movement. When I say non-aligned movement, unfortunately, uh, the non-aligned movement still exists, but no one knows about it. Actually, Iran is now the, uh, the, the, the country which is uh, the pre the holding the presidency, if I'm not wrong, of the non-aligned movement. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have a power anymore. But when I speak, I mean, this is on the geopolitical level. When I speak about this, I think what we need, I mean, it's not a new idea. You will know that better. It's internationalism. So I mean, one of the reasons why Syriza failed, or I would say rather why Syriza didn't succeed, is that it, it's the old, old motto. You can't have communism in one country. You cannot have. Uh, 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 and that's the reason I, as well why I think that Thomas Piketty is wrong in this sense, although I appreciate him very much, I have read the book, I have met him, we discussed about it, blah, blah, blah. Because when he says, you know, okay, uh, the solution for the problem of uh, inequality in the world, where we have 1%, 99%, is that we will have heavy taxation. My spontaneous answer is, okay. But if it doesn't function on the world level, in each and every country in the world, it won't function at all. Like imagine it functions, you have heavy progressive taxation on the 1%, the rest of the money uh, goes to the, to the 99%, so you don't have 1% anymore, but you have 30%, 70% whatsoever. 
okay, but the rich will just transfer the money to Luxembourg and so on and so on, so you will have capital flows. So I mean the problem of Piketty, and again the problem of Syriza, I would say, although it's not the same problem, but the pattern is the same, is that if you don't have internationalism, it won't succeed. So in the sense, if you don't, if you don't change the very presuppositions of the very system, what do we need? Heavy tax, taxation. And I think, unfortunately, this is my answer to the, this is the, I, and I think this should be the, 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 the position of the left, of the true left. This is my answer also to the, and then maybe we can go to the strategy question. This is also my answer to, so this is part of, of the answer for, for your question, and then I come back to strategy. Uh, you know what's my problem with the refugee crisis? My problem for the refugee crisis is that no one is actually speaking about the real problem. So of course you can, you can say Merkel's, uh, Merkel's uh, uh, decision to, to invite all the refugees to let one million people inside of Germany was positive or it was negative. Of course you can say about this decision that either on the one hand that uh, 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 Merkel showed that the humanist ideal of European Union still exists, but an optimistic approach to Merkel's decision. You can go in the other direction and say that Merkel was actually a very cynical, brutal uh, capitalist leader who realized that if you have one million people who are coming, you can do the standard trick, uh, cheap labor force, blah, 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 and, and something which actually just a few days uh, after uh, the Balkan route started, uh, the CEO of Mercedes said, when he said, you know, yeah, let's let all refugees in because they will help to create a new German Wirtschaftswunder as it existed already during the 70s and 80s. So you can approach this, either this or that. Then, of course, you can go in the direction and say that the decision uh, that uh, uh, Germany and the European Union is giving a lot of money to Turkey in, uh, in order to stop the refugee waves in Turkey is, again, very cynical because it represents outsourcing, outsourcing of the problems from the core of Europe again to the periphery, similar to building walls in Morocco, for example. Uh, or Frontex, what Frontex is doing on the shores of, of Lampedusa and so on. And you can mention more and more measures. You can say, okay, after Köln, what we need? Well, we need a new model of multiculturalism. We need, we need a new model of integration. We need a new model of, of education, blah, blah, blah. But I think, although we need to discuss all these things, and although we need to discuss, yeah, how do we transfer refugees from one country to the other because they are coming, I think it is, again, wrong. And why is it wrong? It is wrong pre precisely because of the reasons which I mentioned, which are connected to the Syrian crisis. Because if you, if you invent new measures how to fight, for example, uh, the, the, the influx of refugees, you're behaving like a pyroman uh, uh, who is, uh, uh, who is uh, uh, enabled to join the fire, firemen forces. You know, it's like the pyroman who is trying to, to, to solve a, a, a fire. In the sense that precisely those powers, France, Germany and so on, who are part of this geopolitical game, are now trying to solve the, to solve the problem by outsourcing the problem or blah, 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 inviting and so on. So unfortunately, I think the only real position is, again, the, the same position goes for, for, for Syriza, the same position goes for Thomas Piketty, and the same goes for the refugee crisis. It's something what Oscar Wilde said in his, uh, his text, uh, The Soul of Man in Socialism, Under Socialism, when he said, you know, if you see a beggar on the street and you give him a penny, of course you will prolong his life, but what, what you will actually do is that you will prolong his misery. So the point is not to give a penny to someone who is begging you money, the point is to change the system which is creating the very possibilities that a, that a person who can beg for money can be on the street. And I think the same goes for the refugees. The point is not as IKEA, you know, the famous Swedish company did recently. They have built 10,000 shelters for UNICEF. So the refugees will now, IKEA, the refugees will now have this fancy Swedish, you know, furniture and so on. The point is not, you know, to build 10,000 shelters which will have the logo of IKEA and they will be much more comfortable than previous shelters or tents and so on. The point would be for the radical left to fight to create such, and then I come to the answer to, 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 to the answer about strategic question, to create such 
a society where it wouldn't be possible that the refugees are coming, where it wouldn't be possible that, again, a capitalist, a capitalist company with a good face can be, again, accumulate money. So the, the answer to your, first, to, to your strategic question is, first, we need internationalism. Syriza couldn't survive because the situation in Europe wasn't right enough so it could survive. We didn't have Podemos, we didn't have Labour Party, blah, blah, blah. Even if you did have Podemos and Labour Party, it would still not be enough. It would still not be enough because I think political parties are not enough. I think what, what is good, which, what, what changed after, nine, after 2011 with the so-called Arab Spring, with the occupations and so on, what was good that in, in the last decade, for the first time, you had the critique of, of verticality. You had the critique of, not for the first time, I mean, you had it already in the 70s in Germany, and then you had the Social Democrats, blah, blah, blah. But okay, you had the, 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 the notion, enthusiasm around the idea of horizontality. You had the, 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 the enthusiasm, the belief that we as people, as uh, uh, autonomous political subjectivities can create our collective political subjectivity out of our own autonomy, which is in a way similar to the Italian autonomist movement from the 60s, 70s, where Negri, Bifo, and other people belonged, for example, just to name the theories, not, not, not the people who are, who, are, who are there. So you had this situation in which I still believe that you can occupy a square, you can create a concrete situation because you know to occupy a square doesn't only mean to be a square to occupy a square means to take in, into consideration each individual it means to take into consideration emotions egos and for, unfortunately narcissism which is a prevailing illness of the left as well masculinism or how do you call it i mean uh, uh, chauvinism and all this you know uh, champagne leftism uh, uh, and such things. You have to take all this into consideration for an occupation to survive. Two weeks, one month, three months, or so on. But then, okay, I say I still believe in this. I still believe that you need horizontality. And then you had another momentum, historical mo sequence, I would say, with Syriza, and now with Podemos. The Labour Party is a bit different concept because you have an existing party which is being reconstructed from inside. Podemos, again, is different than Syriza because it's not a coalition and so on and so on. But then you had a new momentum where a lot of people who were also part of the movements realized, okay, it is not enough to be at the square, it is not enough to, to have an occupation and to resist, because when the day after comes, when the police comes and they chase, at, chase us out of the, of the square, what do we do? We have to be organized. And then a political party is one, not the only one, a possible mean to organize ourselves. But what is still missing, I think, is, 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 is precisely internationalism. It's, it's, it's something which is missing on the European level, which would connect the movements on the one hand and the political parties. Trade unions on the one hand, public events on the other hand. The theater scene on the one hand, uh, Alter Summit, European Social Forum, World Social Forum on the other hand, and so on. So I think the strategy, I mean, for the global left, then we can speak about Georgia, but we can also take other, other questions. And I'm not here to preach you or to, to, I mean, you know better than me what is the situation like. I'm just speaking from, from some experience because we had some similar experience. The situation, and I think this is a huge step forward for the left, to combine these three things. Because five years ago we believed, or at least a lot of people believed, we don't want to join any political parties. We're against political parties. We will be just on the squares. And this way, we are the revolution. You know, when they ask the people on Occupy Wall Street, so what is your message? What do you want to do? No, we are the message. We are the solution. I mean, look at the Occupy Wall Street now. I mean, there are some things which are creative and so on, but Obama is still in power, and you will get an even worse leader of the US, which is Hillary Clinton. Then again, the solution is not to have a political power, a political party, and to invest all your projections, to invest all your wishes, all your desires in a leader. Tsipras doesn't wear a tie, so he's a cool guy. Varoufakis rides a motorbike and he has a leather jacket, so th this is our guy. Corbyn is now a cool guy and so on. And what happens when those people don't, don't succeed? Then, of course, the left, again, falls into another illness, which is very common among the left, which, is called, which by Walter Benjamin was called left-wing melancholia. So this guy there, with the leather jacket didn't give us orgasm, and it's his fault that I didn't get an orgasm, it's not my fault. I mean, to put it in these brutal, uh, brutal terms. 
which are not brutal, but this is precisely what happens with the left. So I think on the one hand, we should get rid of left-wing melancholia. Like in the sense, there have been better times, it has been better for the left and so on. No, it has never been better. We have to look in the future. On the other hand, we have to get rid of this false enthusiasm where we all tend to project our own desires into either leaders, protests, and so on. We have to, brut we have to be brutally realistic, learn from our defeats. Because we had a lot of defeats, more than victories, and what we, we need now is a new victory. And I'm afraid we cannot reach a new victory, or at least a small victory, if we don't take into consideration this level of organizing. Yes, we need trade unions, we need public events, we need theater, we need a reform of education, we need occupations, we need love. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like hippie bullshit, yeah, but the left is not speaking about love, for example, you know? So I'll stop here and... <laughs> okay, <laughs> any questions? Because I'll start speaking about love, and that, that will not end up good. Just a second, so I take the thing. Yep. Madloba, sa interesa moksene bistuis, da sa interesa pasute bistuis a sebe. Marslats sa kaliso isro tkuenda patoni fukuyama ert kalak shikart eha. Da arm kolot am lekciz da arm kolot tkuen tigne bizgabo. Arm di bizgabo tsro razil aparakot. Tkueni moksene bis sa taur ki tkus nishni tari formule bunda. دموکراتیس دست از رولی. یه خواب این آن است رو مثلا سپتامبر پکویم از آن از آن است. یه دموکراتیس زیاد باش. دا اس که دوست دارم تو خواهی. دا آن پانل زه سامی آدمیانی مناطقی را از سری ساکت کوس پریزیدنتی، پریمیر مینیستری دا شرط اوضاع داده بیس اولش ساکت کوش. نه در کنده آرویتی دچون آرویتی رازی ساوبر بنیسی نی توم تا البات ماتی خدوا اکنون با اپتیمیست دوریم داره البات راست سه زب گاکی می دیروی پا بیاره. آمیتام سه تا اون دگامم دیناره و پیکر پرو ماتی گانس خوبه و دنبال بگویم از گانس خوبه تیکنه با اپتیمیست دور. میت کن تان مکنه باید سه چکیت با. کسی که بیاد کوین سکپتیسیزمی مگر ام تو آریسی سه تیرام ریس راست سه راچیز لبا گایزیارت Mat optimis. Okay, I can answer or okay. Uh -huh, that's you. <laughs> no, I just heard um, I can answer in Georgian. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the information and thanks for being here, although I said the competition is very, uh, very strong. But actually, this is something which gives me hope, you know, that in this room you have more than 100, I don't know, 200, I don't know how many people who are here and not at the other event. But if you ask me, yeah, I mean, of course they are optimistic. I remember very well uh, a situation, so I was uh, about... 10 days uh, at Sukoti Park at Occupy Wall Street, then I returned back to Croatia. And I was invited precisely by the US ambassador in Croatia uh, to participate at a public event about Occupy. And I was surprised, you know, why are you inviting me, you know, to speak about Occupy? Are, did, didn't Occupy fight precisely against people such as you and your American policies? And you know what they were doing? They were searching for democracy again. <laughs> I mean, what does it mean to search for democracy in their, in their discourse? They even used Occupy Wall Street as a proof that the US is a democratic society. So can you imagine, for example, that uh, at the Red Square in Moscow you would have such a thing? No, because Putin is a dictator. So we had this thing at the Tsukoti Park, which is a proof that in the US we have real democracy. And of course, this is bullshit. This is a lie. And when it comes, you know, I mean, for me it was enough to hear what you said, you know, who are the participants of the other event. So it's Fukuyama, the president of Georgia, the prime minister, and the US ambassador. I mean, that's pretty clear what it means. I mean, uh, when, when you ask me what does it mean when, if their title is in search of democracy, I mean, you remember very well that 
the logo when, when, when US was bombarding Iraq or Afghanistan was bring them democracy. So they brought them democracy in the form of bombs. And the same thing is now happening in Syria. You know, they want more democracy. Excuse me? Yeah, I mean, they lost in Afghanistan, Iraq, and they are searching for new terrains. I mean, it's like, I don't know in which, in which science fiction movie, you have it in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. If you remember that movie when aliens comes and then they penetrate in your body, and then once they penetrate it, they want something else and so on. So they also go on, so now they want to penetrate in Syria. And democracy, I mean, on this level, democracy in the, in the, in, in the case of Syria, to speak about democracy, that we will bring democracy, is a very cynical thing for me, because I also had the luck to be in Syria, in Damascus, during Assad, who is still in power. I don't claim that Assad is, you know, a good guy. I don't claim that Gaddafi is a good guy. I know about the atrocities and so on. But Syria, during Assad, at least had a secular government, more or less democratic elections, and it was a country where tourists could even drink alcohol and so on. And it was the same with Iran. And I think we have to put these parallels because precisely people such as those people who are at the other event were the biggest propagators already during the 80s for our intervention in those, those countries. So for, for Iran, for example, I had the luck also to be in Tehran one year ago. Yeah, in Tehran, unfortunately, women wear veils. You cannot drink alcohol in public spaces. You don't have so much public spaces. After the Khomeini, Khomeini revolution, uh, Khomeini shut down. 20 or 30 cabarets in Tehran. You don't have many cafes because you know from the book from Richard Sennett, Paul of the Public Man, that cafes were the places during the French Revolution where people would join and speak about the revolution. So of course you don't have so many cafes anymore in Tehran and so on and so on. But should we blame them? I mean, of course, Khomeini has a responsibility. Of course, ISIS has a responsibility. But ISIS is precisely a boomerang of our politics. So, for example, if you take the, 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 the parallel with Khmer Rouge, you had a situation where not only Vietnam was bombarded, but you had a situation where Cambodia was bombarded, and you had a little fraction of, of lunatics uh, led by Pol Pot, who were like 200 people or something, and then what, what did the U.S. do at the end of the 60s? They bombarded Cambodia in an equivalent of five Hiroshima bombs, equivalent of five Hiroshima bombs, and those 200 people started to grow. And it's the same with ISIS, I think, today. And it's very, something very similar to what happened in Iran. So Iran, also during the 50s, also during the Shah, although the Shah was an idiot who was very, uh, very in favor uh, to the Western powers, King and San Moritz and so on. So of course, people could also drink a bit and so on. Uh, but you had a guy who was called Mohammed Mossadegh, whose biggest failure whose biggest, biggest uh, 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 yeah, his biggest failure, let's call it like this, sometimes I miss some words uh, because I start to think in Croatian, uh, was that he tended, and that's happening you know, in, in, in these countries as well, during the privatization processes, that he attempted to nationalize uh, the, the British Petroleum Oil Company which had, uh, I think, more than 50% of shares of the Iranian national company. So he wanted to, to do something which, for example, Tito did in Yugoslavia. The railways will be Yugoslavian railways. The banks will be Yugoslavian banks. The telecommunications will be Yugoslavian telecommunications and so on. The situation in Croatia now is that you have 90% of the banks which are Italian, German, uh, and so on banks, that the te telecommunications is German owned and blah, blah, blah. So what Mossadegh attempted to do in Iran is to nationalize Iranian, uh, British Petroleum. What British Petroleum did as an answer, they called CIA and they invented the coup d'etat. And then, of course, you had Khomeini and then you had the radicalization of people who see the only answer in radicalism. And it's the same with ISIS. So if you ask me why are they speaking about democracy, they're speaking about democracy since... Congo, and it's, it's not only the Americans, you know, they killed, Leopold killed 10 million, 10 million people in Congo, and he spoke about democracy. We were speaking about democracy in Haiti, we were speaking about democracy in all the countries. So I think, you know, they are not really going to, to find this democracy, because this democracy consists 
A, in new wars, in new so-called human, human interventions, and second, which I think is a very important point, and I would love that we could, you know, have devoted, have devoted the whole lecture on this topic, it's technology. It is precisely U.S. who is now connected with the Silicon Valley tech companies who will in the near future prevent any form of real democracy. Because if you cannot choose the means which you use, then you are comp completely impotent. And I mean, this device here, which I, I, I have in my hand, is the cheapest surveillance uh, uh, technique ever, which ever existed in history. I mean, it's enough that I have this in my pocket, that I, even if I shut it down, it's not enough to not be surveilled, for example. And when you have the police state with terrorism and so on, it will be normal that companies can surveil and so on. So I think, I mean, I'm sorry, again, I'm going into pessimism. <laughs> More and more, we are approaching a situation where there will be less and less democracy. And the other camp will try to convince us that this is precisely what democracy means. But you can buy a new iPhone. You can buy a new version. You can use Google. Uh, we, we need to give the people of Syria the right to vote and so on. And you know, so in this sense, it's not only a very material fight in the sense that we have to integrate trade unions, that we have to work with those for 400,000 miners and go there and be with them and support them and so on, it's also, with, which gives me hope again, which I think you mentioned before, uh, or someone about the media, that again, that you, sorry, I look too much <laughs> in different directions, uh, that, and talk too much, uh, that, uh, you know, it's a discursive struggle as well. And it's not true that it's not a discursive struggle. You know, I remember, and here I end and give space for more questions. When Alice in, Alice in Wonderland asks Humpty Dumpty, how is it possible that a word can have so many meanings? You know what Humpty Dumpty answers? It depends only who is the master, and that's all. And I think this is the crucial question. So who will give the meaning to democracy? Is it them, or is it the indignados who gave a new meaning to democracy? Who will give, me, give meaning to a humanitarian intervention? Is it us or is it them? Who will give meaning to the refugee crisis? Is it, is it the right-wing extremists or is it the left? So I think at the same time, it is a discursive struggle as well. I mean, that's the reason why we, why, why, why we are here. Me, that's what I'm saying, that it's what me, it's a lot when the interest of the heart, the heart, Mojrao Bebitats, Mat Shoris, Champions Nobili at Queni, Interesi Theatris Mimart, Amito Mindaro, Helone Bazakit Hot, Amas Sin Randenimet Wissin, Barupakisi, Stumrob da Rusets, that is Taestro, Moscovis, Tanamedro, Helone Bis Biennalis, Da Ethert Interview Shim, Isla Parakob da Helone Bis. Revolutionary Zalaze, Helene Bis Zalaze, Wartinos Mobilizeba Chagris in Africa. To him interview, she is like Mount Peura Mesambuda. Magalita Tambuda Imasro is Fambo Yamara Mines, Waxen to Magalita Tambuda Imasro. Put in the area absolute what Martali wrote the sets. I hope sort of what Martali Orietas Rwats else wrote the sets. Shemovita Sakatos territories is Swa. Swa operi denari me khelone bas mida ta oplonde minda kit khod rogor kheda ot khelone bis rolls chaguris cine akdek zolash am kit khas swam imit omrom chen tasat kheda ot sundats im khelo im khelo antagan romle bits me mart khene bat representir debian chen kheda ot sakutari. Este ki sakutari sakhelo ne bo imijis mudmi ukla utar moe bas matu khida. Chuan khedaot at mojra ubas ragot benia minit khoda tida bist khut matit zotish tuis. Atau khedaot at memarts khene melancholias khelo anis khida ne romelit romelit stilo sakht zairos chagura magram am tavi sakht zairil chaguras. Fist twists, sir. So, I am actually chagrined. So, I said, "But me, this whole me, I'm at fist twists. 
خیلی زیبا ایسیام و نوش مغالی خیلی من بید. چه میکی تواری اورنات زیلیانی ارثی رگور خدا بود خیلی وانیس رولز چگونه استی نخواهد بود زولاشی دا اخت زریز گردا شاولیا تو شاید لب تو ارا سخیلو من بود نظر موبشی چگونه است اخت زریز گردا گایل وس راغت سپردید ما راغت ایمان رام برزولیس مگوارم مطلبا یکن به آخری پارتیش از خبرت اسحاق رو تونو کرد. آخری پارتیش از خب. اخم. 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 Uh, so thanks a lot for the first for, for the first question. I, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, actually, for the two, so the first was the role of the artist. I will sum it up and then I will answer in detail. And the second uh, uh, about, if I understood you well, the purpose and the meaning of this, describing, for example, oppression, does it make sense or not? Uh, in a way, I mean, I'll try to, to answer. For first, first of all, I agree and I don't know about his uh, uh, view on Georgia, I didn't hear that. But I agree completely with Varoufakis on the point uh, uh, that art had, has, and needs to have a revolutionary role. Not all art, I'm also not someone, I mean, you know, there is some art which is, but this is a problem, uh, okay, then we come back to the describing problem as well, you know. Uh, I think, okay, let's put it like this. Uh, Every and each art, even if it's not addressing uh, problems of social inequality or discrimination or something, uh, if it is really art, it is revolutionary. What does it mean? It means that if going to a theater play, if looking at a, at, at, at a painting which will make you cry, for example, if reading a book, by Kafka or Rilke or I don't know whom, uh, or producing the artwork. If, it, if this, this very moment, which can be short or long, it can, it, can, it can last as well, is capable of changing your life, then it is revolutionary. I mean, of course, then, then we can very easily fall into the trap and say, of course, were the futurists revolutionary? I mean, they were more connected to fascism and so on than to leftism. Yes, unfortunately or fortunately, they were revolutionary because they, they knew where the times are going, in a way. But uh, uh, when you ask me about the role of the artist, let's now talk clearly from a leftist perspective. Uh, I'll give you three, three examples. The last is not leftist at all. The last is from Sarajevo. So the first one is, uh, the, we are at the theater as well. Uh, the first one is Teatro Valle from Italy, uh, which was a theater in, which is a theater in Rome, uh, where Pirandello had uh, one of his first uh, premieres. It's a very famous ancient theater, not ancient, but old theater in Rome. And it was supposed to be turned into a casino. Uh, so uh, cognitive workers, theater workers, actors, directors, and so on, decided to occupy the theater and uh, they succeeded to have the theater in occupation for, for even several years. Now it's not occupied anymore. And it was happening simultaneously with the other movements in Italy. For example, in Italy you had the big uh, water, mo uh, water movement, let's call it like this, the referendum against privatization of water. Uh, at the same time you had Greece, you had Indignados in Spain, and some group decides to occupy a theater. And it wasn't that the only group. In, in, in Italy, you had also occupations of the skyscraper in Milan. And in other parts of Europe, you had similar examples where cultural workers come to the same uh, idea and to the same uh, answer to the same problem as people who, uh, who, 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 who decide, for example, to occupy a square. So that's the first example. This is the role of the artist. You cannot only watch at the oppression you have to participate in resisting the oppression. But then, before I come to two other examples, here can precisely lie the problem, as you detected well. The, 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 
The only problem is not, and I despise all these artists, you know, uh, who, 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 who think their art is precious because they have one million followers on Twitter, for example. I mean, recently another artist made a great experiment. He, he invested money and bought uh, the Twitter likes or Facebook likes in order to prove that, you know, it doesn't mean anything. I can buy one million likes and then, of course, like we did, as in case of, of several famous artists, I don't want to name them, we can name them, whatever. I mean, you, know, you will know probably about whom I speak about. You know, you read an article which is about an artist and then you see, yeah, he's a very famous artist because he's a dissident, blah, 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 and he has one million followers at Twitter. As if this means anything at all. As if, I don't know, Van Gogh had one million followers on Twitter. Or he was poor, or uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, or, or I don't know who. So when it comes to this, I despise this, because I think, yeah, art has already become part of the market. But what I think is even more dangerous on a different level, when artists start to uh, describe oppression, or when they fall into the trap of representation, uh, it's that, in a way, it's narcissistic. I mean, they can believe that they are changing something by describing. I will give you an example of this. Uh, but in the end, they are actually not helping the people whom they are trying to help by describing, I'm talking about represent representational art. But they're actually just filling the already full space of discourse with another discursive practice. So for example, if you have the refugee crisis, and you make photos of the refugee crisis, and you read uh, 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 testimonials of refugees in a gallery, yeah, I mean, we need that as well. It can help, it can help some people to realize, you know, when you read thousand pages of, 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 of experiences of, of different refugees, and some people come in the gallery and they don't know about it, then they read it, and once you read it, this is the act of pronunciation, so you leave it, and blah, 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 blah. I mean, I don't want to be too negative about it. You have this in a city where refugees are a corner away from the gallery. So why are you doing this? Go to a gallery in New York and do that in New York and maybe those people don't know about it. You could go to the refugees and do something with refugees, for example. And it, you know, on the one hand, it, 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 it brings us back to, to, to a very old dilemma uh, which Stefan Zweig, the famous writer, already had, who emigrated, uh, escaping Nazism to, to Brazil. And then he wrote an article for New York Times Review of Books where he said, you know, after all the miseries which we, have, we, which we have seen after all the concentration camps, refugees, and so on, does literature still make any sense? I mean, any refugee can give me a better story than I can as Stefan Zweig in Web. So what's the point of literature anymore? And at this point, he said, I won't write literature anymore. I, I mean, it's a very interesting thesis. I don't agree. I, I, I don't say this is the right thing to do. I mean, we remember also Adorno and poetry after Auschwitz and, and, and these things. Uh, but in a situation where you have one million people in several months passing through Europe to do an exhibition, instead of to do something with the refugees, for example, I think again brings us to, to the very pleasant position of artists uh, who are actually not ready to really dirty their, their, their hands. So now I come to the second example which I wanted to name. Uh, when I was living in Athens uh, during July last year, I, I made a research on, on theater in Athens. Research to some degree. I published a text where I gathered a lot of people. I wanted to find out what is happening with theater as a reaction to the crisis. And I must say, because I am in theater to some degree as well, I mean, I'm I even acted in a theater play very badly. Uh, uh, and I, 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 I organized some programs. And I know very well the, the Western theater scene, where, for example, in Berlin, you have a lot of money for production, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, you know, you produce something which should be very subversive, radical, and you have tens of thousands of euros at, at disposal. And in the end, you have something which is not radical at all. But in Greece, on the other hand, what I have seen in July is that you have people who don't have any money. And what they do is radical. It is resisting oppression. It is uh, questioning uh, uh, austerity measures, and it is 
which is in the end the only important thing when we speak about art, it is good art. So there is a collective, for example, who works, who works with refugees. They are not making photos of refugees, putting it in a, at, at an exhibition. They work with them. They try to learn the refugees how to act. They go to prisons, and they, they, they do theater in prisons. And why do they do theater in prisons? They do theater in prisons because they say, once you get into the prison, and you can imagine that, for example, a refugee, whoever is in prison, once you get in the prison, you lose, you lose immediately your individual identity. You become part of a collective. As part of a collective in the prison, it's a very special collective because uh, you are not enabled to, for example, to show your emotions or something like that because you will be perceived as you know, a weak person and in prison you should be strong, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you cannot, that's the other thing, so it's a very personal thing. You cannot really show your emotions. The other thing in prison which happens is that you cannot tackle the authority of, the, of, of prison because you could get some sort of more years in detention, whatever, some sort of sanctions. So if you come with theater into prison, you can do both because it's a play. So again, what they are doing now, and they're they doing it deliberately, they are uh, relying on Paulo Freire, critical pedagogy and such things, critical theater as well. Uh, they, are re they are rebuilding the collective, uh, collective uh, subjectivity again which then becomes a political subjectivity because the prisoners are now together producing something. Then when they produce something, if it's, I don't know, uh, Hamlet and he's asking himself questions about his father or it is another play or it is Chekhov, they can even cry. So it's now it's okay because you can cry it's a theater play. Although the real question is what's the difference between real cry because that's another question. And they can tackle authority. If you do Antigone in a prison, it's different than if you do Antigone outside. I mean, it's not necessarily different, but by doing Antigone in prison, you can resist to the oppressive authority. So in this sense, I think that should be, I mean, I'm no one to say what should be the, the role of, of artists, but I think, you know, instead of reproducing, instead of representation, instead of describing, I think, I think artists should produce. Artists should produce, not necessarily that for me, uh, a leftist artist or a decent artist is someone who goes to refugees, blah, blah, blah. This is all, not, also not the criterion. You have to be involved directly, so that's only something which counts. But you have to produce something which is able to change your life or to change the life of the other. Like, for example, last example, which is the, uh, the, 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 the example which I like most, like during the siege of Sarajevo, which was the longest siege uh, uh, of, of, of a city in modern history. Uh, there were two things which were important to people. One thing was going to get water in order to survive, food, cigarettes, and so on. And they were ready, you know, to, to, to run on the streets, although the, the Ser Ser Serbian snipers were above on the hills around Sarajevo and so on. They would be ready to go, you know, I mean, it's, it's a natural, uh, reaction, you know, you need water, you need cigarettes as well, and such things. And the other thing which was crucial during the siege of Sarajevo, you know what it was? It was theater. So it's not only that, you know, people such as Susan Zontak uh, 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 came to Sarajevo. Susan Zontak did, by the way, Waiting for Godot, which then can be interpreted as Clinton or the European community or the West who didn't do anything in order to stop the genocide in Srebrenica, for example, or the siege of Sarajevo. Uh, other people came to Sarajevo as well. But the most important thing is when you, when you, when you read, when you listen to the, uh, to the memoirs, to the statements of people who were involved in, in theater during the siege of Sarajevo, uh, for example, you have a guy, this is the most beautiful scene, scene in a movie about Susan Zontag's uh, 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 theater play. Uh, you have a guy who is like middle of 20s, uh, he was part of, of uh, uh, Waiting for Godot. He's sitting on, on, a, on a sofa. His wife is here. You don't see that she is pregnant. She says that she is pregnant. Bombs are falling around. And he says, you know, one day I got a letter from a friend. I think it's Denmark or Scandinavian country. And my friend, friends, I was started, starting to read the letter. And the letter said, you know, my friend said, oh, I'm so worried about you. Uh, you're there in Sarajevo during the siege. You should 
come, I mean, we will, you know, come to exile, escape the situation. And you know what the guy says? He's sitting at the sofa, his wife is pregnant, the child will soon arrive. He says, no, this is the best time of my life. Because it's this, for the first time, the theater makes sense. Like, you, you had a, a, another actress uh, who said, it was for the first time that I was on the stage, and there was no barrier. There was no, I don't know how we call it in, in, in English, we call it rampa in Croatian. You, you, ramp. you didn't have any barrier between the audience and between the actors. Because she said, you know, me as an actress, I was freezing to death. I was hungry. I was afraid the bomb would fall. And everyone in the audience had the same fear. Like they were, they, they were identifying theater as something for what you are ready to die. And if you have art for which you are not ready to die, then it's not art. If you do something in your life for which you are not ready to die, then I'm also not sure if, if, if your life really makes sense. I mean, that's my perception. It doesn't, I, I don't want to go, to go into the direction to say that everyone has to live like that. But for example, I would, I would commit suicide if there w wouldn't be anything for, I would, for what I would be ready to die, which is a bit contradictory, but then I would be ready to die for, this, for the very notion that I'm ready to die. For. Okay. <laughs> Too complicated. Excuse me, there was another question about the DM25 initiative. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. <laughs> now I have to say I'm ready to die for it or something. Uh, okay, let, let, let's be serious. Uh, <laughs> So after the experience with, 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 with Syriza in Greece, uh, I mean, the experience the left had, the whole left, the, the European left, if you can call it like the European left, the, the, the experience the left had with Syriza in the sense that you had a radical left party which uh, tried with all its strength, and I believe Tsipras was honest in his attempt, uh, it tried with all its strength, with all possible means, uh, to transform the society, to end austerity measures, to re renegotiate the debt, and to fulfill the Thessaloniki program. So with this, when you had this experience, and when you had the experience of the referendum, which was a real miracle in Greece, where 62% of the uh, Greeks voted no to austerity measures, although the rest of the mainstream media, supported by the oligarchs, supported by Angela Merkel, Wolfgang Schäuble, and so on, were against it. So if you have this experience, that experience, and if you have the experience of the next day, when Varoufakis resigned, a logical, natural question comes to the table. What can the left do? Like, okay, either we say there is nothing we can do, and we say this was, it was a miracle, we don't believe in miracles anymore, anymore, we will retreat to our public events, we will retreat to our academic jobs. That's one position. That's the position of left-wing melancholy, which happened to a lot of Congress. Then you have another position, which is the position which the current Syriza government is, is, is undertaking, which is the position no, we, don't, we won't fall into the left-wing melancholy. We will try in conditions which are cruel to do the impossible thing. Even undertake the risks that in a very short period we will turn into the very opposite of we were advocating with the Thessaloniki program. So there is, this is the second position. And the third position undertaken by Varoufakis now, and a lot of people are, are uh, not only Varoufakis, uh, but it's an idea which actually came naturally out of the Greek defeat. Let's call it defeat. Let's not call it failure, but call it, it was a defeat of the left. But it wasn't a defeat of Syriza. It is our defeat, I would say. And if we come to this level of, of consciousness and self-critique to say, 
to, 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 to realize that it is our defeat and not Tsipras is a traitor, Syriza is a traitor, it's Syriza's defeat. Yeah, they did wrong things. But also us, we did wrong things. Or even worse, we didn't do anything. So I think it's not only enough, you know, to create a solidarity campaign with Greece, which was existing all around Europe. It is not enough to create during the referendum, after the referendum, a Twitter profile and say this is a coup. Although it's very nice to see that, you know, millions of people in Europe were participating uh, via Twitter and thinking the same. I think what we should have in mind here is the old lesson what, what Ho Chi Minh already gave to some Italian communists who came to Ho Chi Minh and asked him, okay, Ho Chi Minh, what, we, what can we do for your cause? And Ho Chi Minh said, go back to Italy and make the revolution in Italy. It doesn't mean we don't need you here, but go back. If you don't do the revolution in your own country, it's not possible that some Greeks there or some Spanish people will do a revolution in their country. So what I think, you know, the, 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 the DM idea came naturally out of the idea that uh, such movements, such attempts, be it political parties, be it movements, have to exist in every country in Europe. And not only that, but these movements and initiatives have to be connected. And they have to be connected not under the umbrella of a new movement. We don't believe that, you know, no one believes that DM uh, is something completely new. I mean, me personally, I've been uh, participating in the World Social Forum. I've been to Dakar, to Tunisia. I have many comrades there. I think it is still something worth fighting for. To the European Social Forum, to the Alter Summit, which was a very similar uh, attempt uh, in order to unite different progressive forces. So the idea of DM is that it will be the, the, the first public event uh, which will actually not be, you know, a, a presentation of, of the movement in Berlin at Volksbühne on the 9th of February with Varoufakis and many other people uh, and many other movements, which is important. It will at the same time be a discussion, a discussion about the defeats of the left, a discussion, an open discussion about uh, the question of organization. I mean, the things with, with about which we were speaking about. Is it horizontality or is it verticality? Is it direct democracy or is it parla parliamentary democracy? Is the combina combination of the two or is it a sort of dialectics of it? What to do with trade unions? What to do with the European Parliament? Uh, how to tackle the question, how to resist TTIP? What to do with the refugees? I mean, there are so many questions on the table. And I think the left should start answering these questions. And the only way we can start not only answering the questions in public events or with, by discourse, by writing articles for The Guardian and blah, 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 is by coming together. And I mean, it's the old idea which has to be rehabilitated of internationalism. United, we will succeed, divided, we will fall. Yep. Uh, you should switch it on. Oh, is it okay? Okay. Uh, I just want to ask you about the uh, public intellectuals and about the academia. You just started to talk about this subject, but then you interrupted. And uh, with regarding to new generation, uh, our generation, who is like who is blamed by media and many other sources, that they stand for nothing, with no hopes, no jobs, and so on. But on the other hand, we have uh, many uh, protests and so on where the main actors are young generations. And I just want to ask you, uh, with regard to the changes of the system, how uh, the, uh, the role of academia, the role of the public intellectuals, and the role of this young generation might be get together to bring some new, real new changes? And what's your perspective on this? Uh, before you ask the question, we, it's, it should be the last question, maybe because we have to finish. Okay. We have to go to the end, and it may be the last huh. question, and to uh, maybe summarize. Ah, so this is yeah. the last. I, I, think, the, yeah. I think it makes sense. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. I didn't think it makes sense to end with this question. Uh, so first of all, I would say that, you know, 
if an intellectual is not a public intellectual, then he's not an intellectual at all. I think that that's the first thing which we have to say. You know, I don't believe that uh, someone can be an intellectual in the sense that you only produce academic papers with, which are then peer-reviewed and you only care about you know, progressing in, in your own sphere, which is fine. And you have very uh, uh, radical even, if you look at, I don't know, quantum physics, for example, scientists who do precisely that. I don't expect of, 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 of a physicist who is uh, specialized in quantum physics to be a public intellectual, to be an intellectual in the sense that he has to speak about Syria and so on. I mean, we, we could imagine how it, would, how it would look like, you know, to apply Heisenberg on Syria. It would mean that, you know, we don't know where ISIS is. I mean, that's precisely what Erdogan is doing, so we will bomb everyone. So we could say that Erdogan is actually apply, applying quantum physics, but that's okay. On a different level, uh, the problem is, I think, with, with the educational system that it's an old problem. It's what Althusser calls the uh, uh, apparatus of the state, in the sense that it reproduces, reproduces a certain form of knowledge. And the certain form of knowledge which is, a, which is reproduced uh, through educational system, through media, through the church, I mean, that's something Althusser named as well. I would add technology here, is precisely the knowledge of the ruling class. Uh, so how can we ex expect a change of the system if we don't go a step back and don't reform, for example, or start speaking about reforming the educational system? Because what, what the educational system does, I don't know about Georgia, but Croatia and Europe has this so-called Bologna reform, which is the... the uh, so it's the same, so you know about it. If you ask me, it will destroy... Uh, the concept of emancipatory knowledge. Not in the sense of uh, emancipatory knowledge in the sense that, that that's a knowledge which can give freedom to oppress, oppressed groups, blah, 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 but emancipat em em emancipatory knowledge in the sense that knowledge is something which emancipates you. Not only from, 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 from your daily constraints, uh, from eco eco economical burden, but it really emancipates your mind. Uh, because this Bologna reform turns students into idiots who, who are trying to pursue projects, who are trying to, you know, get uh, grades, who are actually they're doing the same what the NGO sector did, in a way. Not the NGO sector, but what, what the NGOization of, of radicalism did. And it's not to blame only NGOs, is that actually, let's imagine this situation. You get money from a certain sponsor, be it Soros, Open Society, Embassy, whomsoever, they will give you money, you have to write a project, you have to state in the project, okay, for the next three months we will do this, blah, 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 then we will do this, then we will do this. Try to find a sponsor who will give you money and say, here is the money, and for the next four years you can do that. Why they are not doing it? Because if you have four years, you know, it's what China or what, what Stalin did, it's called Petoljatka, you know? And if you have the possibility of a Petoljatka, or how do you call it in, in Georgian? Probably similar. Uh, Five-year plan. Then you have the possibility to really plan your activities. If if you have if you have to be constrained in the sense in, the, in a temporal way that okay I will give you this money and then you have only three months to invite someone to have a speech to 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 write a report on the speech and then I will give you no money to to, to tackle another. So today we make refugees. Next month we speak about. Uh, homosexuals, the next month we speak about uh, green color. And we will give, so, you know, and that's precisely what happened in, in, in ex Yugoslavian post communist countries. I mean, the NGO sector was the first sector which uh, was fighting. Actually, the, 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 I'll come back to the, the public intellectual, but I think this topic of NGOs is important. So, uh, the NGO, if there wasn't the NGO sector, no one, for example, in ex Yugoslavia would deal. Uh, with the victims of war, with the victims of Srebrenica, and so on and so on, because you had a situation that the state couldn't anymore deal with it because the state was dismantled. So you didn't have a state who could deal with, you know, people who are victims of rape, who are victims of genocide, and so on and so on. But then what happened is that the most quality people, either from academia or from the streets and so on, turned into the NGOs, the NGOs themselves, 
they start, they, 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 their brain was reprogrammed in the sense that you start to think only about new projects and new projects. And they're not blamed. I don't blame them. I blame the system which is, you know, uh, behaving like that. And I think the same applies to the, to the Bologna reform. Like, it's not only the Bologna reform, like right? in Croatia you have, not high schools, primary schools where children are speaking about fucking projects. Like as if they are small capitalists who will make a project and then you have children from a primary school who already perceive knowledge as something, as I said, mentioning Lazzarato, the entrepreneur of the self, where you actually have to invest your own money in order to be capable of ending up at the, at, at the labor market. And I think this is completely the opposite of something what a public intellectual should be, or, or of what knowledge should be. Knowledge shouldn't be about uh, instrumentalization, because then you will end up in the dream of the other, and that's the dream of the US, big think tanks, and so on. How can we use the knowledge of Silicon Valley in order to buy nine drone companies and then go you know, to war, for example? And this is precisely what is happening. Like you have a, a, a guy in India who created a startup, but now, of course, because of money and so on, he is uh, uh, co-opted by the big Silicon Valley companies. So what you can see actually is that we are really approaching a stage where knowledge is being co-opted, where knowledge is being privatized, where knowledge is being instrumentalized, and where people are really brainwashed in the sense that people who, even people who go to universities, and I, again, I, I cannot blame them. You know, if you go to, to, to university, you want to have a knowledge which you can use because you have to pay your rent. Your mother or father is ill, you have to pay, you know, the medicine. So, okay, yeah, I want to have some knowledge which I can use. But what knowledge do I have? I studied philosophy and linguistics, for example, and I'm today in Georgia. I rejected uh, a career at the academy, uh, and I could be a full-time professor in several years, blah, 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 because then I couldn't do this. We can do different changes in, in different aspects of our lives, but if we don't go back where most, I mean, some people here have children. When the children are being raised up, what is happening is actually that you have, if you have a child who is going to kindergarten, for example, or to primary school, what is happening is that the child is not only being swallowed into the system, but the brain of the child, it may sound like ridiculous, but I, I, I use this term, is being reprogrammed. Because the child stops to speak in categories. Uh, uh, st stops to think outside of categories. And to end with an anecdote, uh, 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 really ending, uh, once I was invited in a small village in Croatia to have a lecture in front of 30 children who were in the kindergarten, so they were five or six years old. And I came there, and I was sitting here, and I was looking at them, but they were staring at me, like, oh, what does it mean? A philosopher came, what does it mean, blah, blah, blah. And they immediately started to raise hands and start so many questions, questions which I never heard before or after, except by children of that age. And what happened, I mean, I was scared to be in front of them, more than I'm scared now, because you cannot predict children, because children think out of the box. I'm not saying that uh, you don't think about the box or that I don't think about the box, blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying that children have a, a, a certain degree of knowledge which consists in posing subversive questions. And once they get through the educational system from kindergarten, primary school to, to high school and then university, and then reading media and then watching television and then all the bullshit which decent, ordinary old people do because they are rational, then you know you lose the potential of change. So I'm not saying in the end that you should do children, that you should, you know, fuck and then have children, but I think uh, we should come back to the questions that children pose. Thanks. <laughs>